In today's session, Pete Bryan will take us through Become a Jupyter Notebooks Ninja Mystic Pi Fundamentals to Build Your Own Notebooks. Pete is a senior software engineer with the Microsoft Sentinel team. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to him. Pete, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jason. And um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, let me just share my screen and we will uh, we will get right to the content. So today we're going to be talking about the uh, creating your own notebooks in, in Microsoft Sentinel. So if you've seen our previous sessions regarding uh, becoming a notebook ninja, you will have covered off how to create an Azure ML workspace, how to load and run a notebook, and how to see some of the, the pre-made content that we've produced for you. But one of the really great things about notebooks is the ability to fully customize them, create your own workflows, create your own investigation techniques. And so what we're going to cover today is the, the basics of creating your own notebooks. Um, and as part of that, we're going to look at Mystic Pi, our Python security tools package, which can help along the way as well as some fundamentals of uh, just Python coding as well. Things that are key to creating your own notebook. So in our agenda that you can see here, we've, we've got a number of different topics, um, including some high level introductions to Mystic Pi and key elements of installing it, um, through to the more advanced data analysis um, capabilities within the package. Um, and then at the end, we're gonna, talk about kind of where you go next from here, because this is just going to be a, a relatively short overview of everything you can do. There's going to be um, a lot more in terms of resources and learning that you can take away and follow afterwards. Um, and as Jason said, uh, please let us know any questions you might have as we go through. So to start off with, uh, what is Mystic Pi? Well, if you've not heard of Mystic Pi before, it's uh, the open source Python software library that uh, we have created here at the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center to provide capabilities to Python users and particularly people who are using Python within a notebook um, to conduct security investigations. It heavily integrates with Microsoft Sentinel uh, as well as other security data sources and allows you to do things like collect data from Microsoft Sentinel into a notebook, it allows you to integrate with uh, external threat intelligence providers and it allows you to perform analysis on data sets using uh, machine learning models. It allows you to create powerful visualizations to look at various aspects of the data um, and is all really focused on making the lives of a security analyst easier. So taking those tasks that you might uh, repeat on a regular basis or might take a lot of code to write in a notebook and simplifying them in a way that's easy to easy to call with a, a line or two of code. The, um, the, the package is available in a number of places, so the source code is up on GitHub for anyone to, to look at and contribute to. The Python package is accessible via uh, PyPI, so if you're, if you're familiar with Python, that'll be one that you'll know, and we, we have pretty extensive documentation about it on read the docs as well. So one of the questions we have to get is, is why use Mystic Pi? And really the, the primary thing is that Mystic Pi has done the work for you. So it saves you time and effort in terms of writing code particularly, but also doing things like working out how API would work and uh, the authentication methods for various services, because we handle that all for you. So uh, if you're working with a notebook and you're using Microsoft Sentinel, uh, Mystic Pi will, will save you time and effort because effectively we've, we've done a lot of that work for you. Now one thing to note as we go through this notebook is uh, we're going to have a few exceptions. Uh, these are errors generated by the code. This is deliberate. We wanted to highlight some of the common challenges or mistakes people make when running notebooks and how to troubleshoot. So this notebook is available um, online. It's on our our Azure Sentinel Notebooks GitHub repo, which will be renamed shortly, but it's still Azure Sentinel for now. Um, but the notebook is available there. But if you if you try and run this yourself, you you will run into it some exceptions. Um, as I said, we'll we'll go through and kind of troubleshoot them during this uh, webinar. Um, but just a heads up if you if you are following along live and kind of want to jump ahead. 
So one of the first things that we need to do when working with a notebook and pretty much any sort of Python development is, is handle importing in, or installing and importing packages. So one of the great things about Python is its vast ecosystem of uh, software packages that allow you to easily um, add capabilities to what you're doing. Um, but there, there are some challenges presented by this around installing and accessing them correctly. And we get quite a bit of uh, user feedback about this being, being a challenge for people. So we wanted to cover it off pretty uh, extensively for you. So if you are familiar with uh, Python already, this, this might be uh, kind of quite entry level for you. But again, if, if this is relatively new, understanding uh, this process and uh, what to do is, is going to be important for pretty much everything else you do. So there are a number of ways to install packages in Python, uh, but really one of the most popular and the, the one we're going to talk about here is pip. This is a, a package installer for Python, which makes both finding and installing the packages uh, nice and easy for us. So you can install uh, the packages either directly from a notebook cell, um, or you can also choose to install directly in your compute. So um, here in AML, we have the option of opening a terminal into our compute, which gives us a, a command line interface into the compute we're using. And we could install things in this interface. Uh, however, we're going to instead run them in the notebook. And uh, the reason we would recommend using this is because um, these compute instances that you have in uh, Azure Machine Learning have multiple Python kernels in them. Uh, these have different versions of Python running. And what can happen is when you're installing, particularly by the CLI, uh, you have the chance of installing the package in the wrong kernel and then your notebook not being able to find it. So installing directly in a notebook in the method we're going to do here is a good way of ensuring that you're always installing in the right place. And to install a package, what we need to do is run this uh, percent sign pip um, and then simply install and the name of our package. So here we're going to install a package called requests, which is a a very widely used Python package which handles um, HTTP connections. And we can run that in our notebook and you'll, you'll see that in this environment um, that uh, we've actually already installed this version of um, requests. It's telling us basically uh, requests and all its dependencies to other libraries request require uh, are already installed. Now this percent sign is um, it's the key bit here. So if you just try pip install request, in fact, we can do it. Um, in this case, it actually worked, shouldn't have done, but it will tell you it's, uh, it should tell you it's invalid uh, Python. Um, the percent sign tells us what we're running is something called a magic in, in Jupyter. So this uh, effectively tells us um, this is a special command that shouldn't be interpreted as, say, Python but is a, uh, is a notebook specific thing. So in this case, it, the notebook knows what pip is uh, and will do the install for us. So what we've done with requests is simply just say install request package. If it's not there, install it. In this case, it is, so don't do anything. But what if we need a specific version? Well, we can do equals equals and a version number on requests. And what that will do is uh, download and install the specific version. So here we can see we're downloading 2.2 and uh, we're in installing that specific version. And what you'll see is a lot of this red text here. So this is a, a good example of something that we come across quite commonly with installing packages. So the reason we've come across this is because in a, in a, a Python environment, you'll quite often have a large number of packages installed. Uh, and each of these packages can have dependencies on other packages. So for example, requests, as I said, is a quite foundational package. It handles HTTP requests. So a whole bunch of other packages that also do that HTTP request stuff will rely on requests for doing that. However, we run into the challenge of different packages having different version requirements. So when that occurs, we end up with this big, uh, big, nice red output that basically says you've just installed version 
in this case, 2.2 of requests. But actually, um, all of these other packages you've got installed have a requirement for a different version. So for example, Mystic Pi, which we're going to talk about in a second, requires version 2.21 or above. Um, so this is just warn warning that you have incompatibilities. This is unfortunately a kind of uh, a challenge that Python faces as an ecosystem and the interdependencies. The, the key thing to know here is that in many cases, this won't cause an irreparable issue. You'll still be able to run the rest of the notebook. Um, the, the red text, often people see this as a, a blocking error and just kind of stop here, but, but it's recommended even if you see this, carry on with the rest of the notebook. There's a high chance it will, will still, still run. So we just installed a specific version of request there, but what if we just want the latest version? Uh, this is probably the most common scenario for people. So in that case, we do the same again, the pip install, but in this case, we do dash dash upgrade. And what this will do is go and install the very latest version of the package. So in this case, we had 2.2 .2 before, but now it's going to get 2.26, which is the latest version. And again, we see we get these, uh, these um, conflicts regarding dependency requirements, but this list is, is much shorter with the latest version than it was with that, that old version we use. But again, we don't need to worry too much about them. Um, there's a good chance the rest of the notebook will be absolutely fine. It's also worth noting actually that these uh, dependency clashes occur much more with um, Azure machine learning than say if you're running this notebook in your own environment locally. That's because Azure ML comes with a whole number of pre-installed packages that um, are useful for data science and machine learning. Uh, but obviously the more packages you have installed in an environment, the higher the chance of these dependency clashes coming in. So you may not see these things if you're running your own notebook environment. Um, so once you've installed a package, you also need to import it. So you will install a package once for your environment, but with importing, you'll need to import it every time you, uh, you run a notebook or if you restart a notebook uh, kernel, you'll need to import again. And uh, there are a number of ways to import. You can just do import package name, or you could do uh, from package name, import a specific function or class that you want to use. Or as we're going to do here, you can do uh, an alias. So it, you can import a package name as some alias. So in this case, we're going to we're going to import the pandas package and call it PD. Now, this is quite a common convention. It just makes it easier when calling pandas functions later because we just have to type PD rather than pandas. From that, you don't get any output from an import, but obviously you see it imported correctly. Now, sometimes you might go to import a package and you find a, this error, module not found. This is simply telling us that the thing that you're trying to import, we don't know about. Now, that might be because you uh, haven't installed it yet, or maybe you've installed it, but you haven't restarted the kernel, so the, the compute environment isn't aware of it. Um, or maybe you've just made a, a typo. So a good way of seeing when you've got a module not found error, uh, what what you're looking for is running this this pip command again with the magic, but this time list, and that will show you a list of all of the the packages that you've got installed using pip in your environment. So here, if we're looking for something like X Y Z, we could call pip list. We could go see if X Y Z was in the list. Maybe maybe it had a different name. Uh, maybe it just wasn't there at all. You will also find that some uh, some packages that you install will have a different import name from the installation name. So here we're going to quickly install scikit-learn, which is a very common and widely used uh, machine learning package in Python. Uh, we install it with scikit-learn. However, to import it, we have to import it with sklearn. If we, in fact, if we try scikit-learn as an import, we get an invalid syntax because you can't have a hyphen in a um, package name you're importing. So there's no good way of knowing exactly what the import name for a package is going to be other than checking the documentation of a package. But um, don't be too surprised if you install something and import it with different names. So now Mystic Pi. This is uh, again the kind of the core of what we're going to be doing today. So 
we need to install the latest version of Mystic Pi, which we already have in this environment. But again, it's that pip install Mystic Pi dash dash upgrade. And again, if you are using Mystic Pi, it's good practice to uh, check that you've got the latest version installed um, on a regular basis, either each time you run the notebook or um, at least on a semi-regular basis. We probably average about a new release of Mystic Pi about once a month, um, often often more. So it is a good idea to keep, keep an eye on, on that. Um, the next thing we need to do is import Mystic Pi. Uh, now Mystic Pi is a, a quite a large uh, collection of tools and capabilities. So if we imported absolutely everything, it would, would take quite a while. So what we've done is create a function called init notebook, which what it does, it's specifically designed for a notebook environment. And what it does is um, does a number of environment checks for us and um, imports the key functionality for us. So you still need to call an import statement first. So Python knows what we're talking about. So we could do import mystic pi and then mystic pi init notebook. Now to the init notebook, we need to pass this thing called globals, which is um, rather than go into the, uh, the kind of workings of Python too much, globals is effectively the environment we're working in. So we're saying, um, handle mystic pi setup within our, our current environment when we run this um, we get a bit of an output telling us that uh, a number of checks are going on checking things like kernel versions and mystic pi versions we're doing uh, imports of all these things um, these are like the common mystic pi elements um, and then we're, we'll get this notebook initialization complete state which is effectively telling us uh, we're good to go uh, you might also get some some warnings here. So perhaps if you haven't configured um, your config file, which we'll talk about in a second, you might get a warning here saying uh, you haven't configured your, your config file yet. That's kind of key for the rest of Mystic Pi. Um, so you, you can still carry on, but it's just warning you that uh, you, you haven't set that up yet. So now after all of that, we're, we're finally ready to go. Um, and the, the key takeaway from that is pip install mystic pi dash dash upgrade followed by import mystic pi and then mystic pi init notebook that's the key things you need uh, to get going with with mystic pi in the notebook so the next step is the config file i'm going to speed through this relatively quickly uh, the reason for it is because the config file is probably another webinar on its own uh, but we also have a lot of documentation and even a, a notebook to help you get started with this. So I will cover off the, the basics here, uh, but there are a bunch of materials uh, both on GitHub and in Read the Docs to help you get this set up completely. Uh, but effectively, the reason Mystic Pi has a config file is because it connects to a whole bunch of other resources. So um, you will have connections to Sentinel, you'll have connections to your TI provider, you might have connections to other security tools like Defender, and all of those require some sort of configuration. This might be details about what to connect to, but it, it's also things like API keys for, for those for Intel providers, for example. And so we need somewhere to store them um, securely and uh, repeatedly, so we don't have to, you're not having to constantly uh, copy and paste things into a notebook. <clears throat> so what Mystic Pi has is a, uh, a YAML file called Mystic Pi config .yaml, which uh, basically holds all these details for us. Now, rather than <clears throat> just creating the, the YAML file on your own, which you, you absolutely can do, uh, what we've done is created a, a visual widget for you. So I'll set this running. So by what do I mean by a visual widget? Well, I basically mean a, a GUI for you. In a notebook, so um, you can you can call this MP config edit feature within uh, Mystic Pi, and what that will do is um, provide you with this, which is our, our little GUI that allows you to set the different things in your config file. Now, here, what you're you're looking at is my config file, and you can see we've got things for Sentinel defined in here. Again, it needs a rename, so this is on our to do list, but um, this is obviously Microsoft Sentinel, and I've got things like the workspace ID for it, uh, the tenant ID for it, things that we need to connect. I've also got settings for my threat intelligence providers, other data providers, 
um, my key vault. So again, uh, particularly with threat intelligence providers, we're, we're holding a lot of sensitive API keys. So rather than store them in this YAML file, I actually store them in key vault. Um, so my config file references my key vault, and then I just uh, have references to the, the key vault um, within the config file. So uh, again, the documentation can talk you uh, through setting all this up. Uh, but the key thing is that you, you have this this GUI method to step through and uh, set up your, your config file with all the different providers you're going to need. And again, like I said, we have on GitHub a, um, a setting up your config notebook you can run through, uh, and our documentation talks you through setting this up, um, including things like where to get the API keys you need, the subscription, the tenant IDs, workspace IDs, all of those things. So uh, it's really worth spending some time um, running through all that getting that config file set up. It's it's kind of a one time thing. Once you've got the config file there, um, each time you've got a notebook, you just uh, load it in. Um, you can either reference a specific kind of file path for your config, or it'll just look in the current folder to see if there's a config file um, and go and use that. So it's a bit of investment um, up front, but uh, once you've got it there, you kind of don't need to touch it. So that said, skip over the rest of the config um down to this section so uh, a couple of key things with the the config that you can do is uh once you've kind of got it all set up the uh the widget sorry I'm scrolling up and down a bit the widget has a, a validate settings feature so you can you can hit validate settings and it'll tell you no no errors no warnings you that's all good to go and then what i can do is run this refresh config feature, uh, which will just load in the latest version of the config into my environment. And from there, I'm good to go. So at this point, um, <clears throat> the notebook knows all about the environments I'm connected to, uh, both for Sentinel and for other things. Uh, so now we can go ahead and use the, the features in Mystic Pi that connect to data sources. So the first one is getting, getting data. Obviously, have another things yet, so let's just do that quick. Getting data from Microsoft Sentinel. So um, this is probably the, the kind of core feature that you're you're going to want to um, use with Mystic Pi. It's kind of the starting point for pretty much everyone. So we'll come back to this AZ login cell in a second, but the first thing I want to talk about is the, the query provider. So the, the query provider is the uh, feature in Mystic Pi, which handles connections to data sources. So when we want to connect to a, a data source such as Sentinel, we need to create a query provider and then we need to connect to it. So we do that by simply calling query provider and telling it what sort of query provider we want to connect to. So here is Sentinel. Um, and then we also need to tell it what, which Sentinel workspace we want to connect to. So in my config file, I've actually got five or six workspaces. Um, here I want to load up this, this demo environment one. So I'm saying create a, uh, a workspace config object for this demo. Run these two. And again, I'm just importing Mystic Pi and setting up again to make sure I've got everything in place. Um, and that's good to go. Now, this WS config that I've just created kind of what is the point of that? Really, the point is to create something called a connection string. So when you connect to Sentinel, you need to pass a connection string to it. Now, you could write this out manually, but um, Workspace Config kind of creates it for you because this is what you're looking for. This is our connection string. Um, it's a bit, bit of a fiddly thing to type out time and again. So you create your Workspace Config, tell it which uh, workspace you want to use, and it creates a string, populates it with your tenant and workspace ID, and then you can just pass that to the query provider when you connect. So here, to connect, we take our query provider we created, tell it to connect, and we pass it that workspace config, which effectively is, is passing it this nice little string. Now, when we do that, what it does, it goes off and um, connects to Microsoft Sentinel. Now, obviously, you can't just connect to Microsoft Sentinel without um, authenticating to the environment. So what it uses is device code authentication. 
So it gives us this code. What we can do is, is copy that and it gives us this link. So if we click on the link, it uh, prompts us for the code. So that's the code that was in the notebook, which I didn't copy correctly. And it asks you to authenticate. So I will do that quickly. So it's asking me for my multi-factor. So I will do that quickly on my phone. And once it's complete, you get a message saying uh, you're connected, you've signed in. So we can now close that window. And if we go back to our notebook, it will tell us we've connected. So great. So we're now connected to our Azure more, our Microsoft Sentinel workspace. Sorry. At this point, we can start to query some data. Now there's um, a number of ways of getting data, but it's all based off of KQL queries, exactly the same as in the, the Microsoft Sentinel interface. So we can write our own queries, but Mystic Pi has a number of built-in queries. So we can we can run this list queries to get a list of all the queries we, we have built into there. Uh, now this list isn't particularly user-friendly, it's just a list. So we've got another feature called browse queries that um, gives us a little visual browser where we can see all of them and we can select them and see a bit more about the, the query itself. Now once we've uh, once we've got all them we can we can run a query. So here we're saying on our query provider run this list all sign-ins geo query. We run that Takes a few seconds to uh, to run because it's quite a big query. This one, something we'll we'll tackle in a second. But once it's uh, executed, we'll get the results back into our our notebook. Um, now these come back in the form of a, a pandas data frame, which we can then investigate and access um, and do all sorts of analysis with. Here we go. Here's our results. That's just returned basically AAD sign in events. This query does. Now. You might not want to necessarily uh, just use uh, the built-in query, so you can also modify them. So if you get this next line here, what we're saying is um, take the security alert query that lists all the alerts in our environment, uh, but modify it to add a query item. So here we just want to get 10 alerts on this one. Now this one we get a, uh, a Mystic Pi query exception. So Again, this is a, a deliberate kind of exception we've put in to show you kind of the challenges with it. And when you get a Mystic Pi data query error, it's normally because there's an issue with the um, the query itself. So you get a an output of the query here and uh, a link here to to some additional documentation to help you with it. Um, but really, it's not particularly nice to re read this query here. But what we can do is Again, we run the same query, but add um, a question mark in. What we do is we get those details about the query that we saw earlier, so we can understand it a bit better. It's a bit easier to read. And what we can also do is run the same uh, query again with the same add items of take 10, but we also added this print statement, just a string saying print. And what this does is rather than execute that query, it prints it out for us. So this is much easier to read than that exception. And if we look here, the issues at the end, we can see that we've got a project away extended props, uh, take 10. But what I'm missing here is a as a pipe to delimit the take take 10 command in the KQL query. So now if I get rid of that and run it here, so this time I'm adding the, the pipe before the take 10. We execute that one. There we go. It's produced our results as expected. So that's a very easy and simple way of um, selecting a query, working out what that query does, modifying it slightly, and then executing it in our environment. So once you're familiar, particularly with uh, the syntax about kind of names of queries, it can be very quick and easy. It's just simply that much code to uh, to run a KQL query against Sentinel and get data back. That's kind of not the only way of doing it as well. We can also write our own queries. 
So the query provider we created earlier has this feature called exec query, which allows you to uh, run any KQL query you like. So here we're saying, is our KQL query it's just a very simple security alert take 10. We define it as a string in Python. So here I'm just calling it query and we call exec query and just pass in that string. And it works exactly the same as those built in queries that we just looked at above. You get a data frame back, including all that data. Um, and again, all of those, uh, all of the kind of features we looked at before uh, work as expected. So all of that is a, a nice simple way of accessing data in Sentinel in a nice easy to use format. And uh, again, the data is exactly the same as you would expect in Sentinel. So all of these fields, all of these columns, exactly the same as if you ran this in the uh, the Sentinel log interface uh, within the Azure portal. Now, one thing I, I just want to circle back to and show you is that when we created this um, query provider, and connected to it, we had to go through that device code authentication flow. Now, that's a bit time consuming, and you will need to do that every time you um, you either restart the notebook kernel or open a new notebook. So one of the uh, the things you, you can do to um, simplify that authentication process is use the Azure CLI for authentication. So that takes us back to this, this AZ login command. So what we can do is run this command and it will take us through the same device code authentication, um, but we'll uh, authenticate the environment we're working on to the, uh, the Azure CLI. What we can then do is use that authentication uh, repeatedly through notebooks, regardless of whether you open a new notebook or restart the kernel. Um, and it will allow you to kind of seamlessly log in without having to do that device code each time. So it's something that, as part of using notebooks every day, I do pretty much just every morning. I run this AZ login. Or I'll, I'll show you it's uh, it's pretty much the same um, experience as the the login we had before, but I I can do this once in the morning, and that uh, login token persists in my environment until um, uh, until uh, the end of the day, and effectively it saves me a whole bunch of time in terms of um, authentication to the environment. We'll just give this a second to execute. Now, while whilst we're waiting for that, the uh, one thing that's a little bit different about this is the exclamation point. What this does is uh, tells the, the cell that we're executing in the notebook to, to run everything following it as a, a CLI command. So rather than uh, treating this as Python, it's saying, oh, this is uh, something to run at the command line, just pass this through to the command line and execute. So I'm not going to wait for that one any longer. We'll just leave this and we can, uh, I think I've got an example of it later we can look at. Right, so back to back to our data. So now we've, we've got some data, we want to do something with it. So here we ran this security alert query and got data in the table and it, it's kind of good, but there's not a whole lot we can do with it. It's not super usable. So instead, what we want to do is run that query, but assign the uh, assign the outputs to a an object. In this case, alert df. We're going to call it. And what we can do is add some code to just show the top of that. So the the head command effectively shows you the first in its default way, first five rows of a, a table for you. So you can see. Great, we've got some data, it's stored as alert df. Here's where we can start going and doing some um, more analysis or um, manipulation of the data to make it more usable and find the interesting things in it. So there, there's a whole number of things that we can do here. Uh, the return data always comes as a pandas data frame. And if you're even vaguely familiar with pandas, you'll know that they're incredibly powerful uh, in what they can do and have a whole bunch of features. I'm just going to kind of cover off some of the, the key ones here, but we can do things like um, access a single row. So lock is effectively saying access uh, the item in our table where the, the index is this value. So one, 
So if we just scroll back up, that is here. This is our index, index one. Here it is. Uh, we can also do things like, say, take take the first five rows and then only show the three columns that we list here. So we want to say, show us first uh, rows zero to five and show us columns, alert name, alert severity, and description. Here we go. Here's our table and just those three columns. We can also search in our, our table. So we, here we can say, show us anything where the alert name column contains credential theft. Again, that is simply just doing a filter on rows um, on, on that alert name column we, we asked for. So really easy to quickly go from big table, lots of data to some, some very specific elements that we want to look at um, or into a deep dive into a particular, particular event. We can also uh, very easily create some uh, visualizations of the data. So here we're saying on the alert severity column, uh, count the values, which is uh, similar to like a summarize uh, count statement in KQL, and then plot that as a pie chart. So here it simply counted up all the different alert severities we had and then a pie chart of them. So we can see the breakdown between high, medium and, and low severity. You can also do other charts, so like a bar chart of the same data. Again, just with the, the counts of each. Here is literally just one line of code once we've got that data. So it's a very quick and easy way of creating some, some very simple visualizations using pandas. As I mentioned before, we also have connection to a whole bunch of threat intelligence providers in Mystic Pi. So this is a, a very common use case that users have. They collect some data from Sentinel and they maybe want to look some of it up against uh, a threat intelligence provider to see if there's any external context for them. What we're going to do here is uh, use exec query again to run our query and we're just going to get um, a sample of 100 sign-in logs here. We return them and then we uh, we assign them to the sign-in DF object. Now we need to log in here so what we're going to do is take our device code again. So this is that CLI login we were talking about earlier. And as I said, it's the, the, the same login flow as we saw before. You provide the code, you provide your uh, your username, and then you have your uh, sign in sign in flow. In my case, uh, I'm using phone authentication. Yes. And we're done. So I can go back to my notebook, uh, wait a second for it to finish. And what we'll do is get a, uh, a nice long output, show me all of the resources and subscriptions I have access to. But really, it's it's not very important. Um, also, I'd like to point out, we are aware this is yellow text on the white background. It's not a great uh, user experience. Uh, we are working with the, the machine learning, Azure machine learning team to get this, this updated. Right. So now we've, we've logged in with the CLI, uh, we're ready to go with some, some other things. So just like with the query provider, with the, the threat intelligence services, we need to uh, create a, um, a threat intelligence lookup object called TI lookup. And here we're just going to refer to it as TI. We're then going to say lookup IOCs, take that sign in data frame, which is our 100 sign ins that we looked earlier take the IP address and look them up against, in this case, the gray noise service. We run this, um, it goes off uh, to Key Vault, gets my gray noise API key that I've got in Key Vault, and then um, starts doing those lookups and takes a little while. Um, but here we come back and we can see that we've got all of our 100 uh, back from gray noise with the results. So it's telling us here's the IP it looked up, um, here's the provider, here's the result, and then we get some more detail. So in this case, we got um, a false and a 404, which for gray noise means that um, it's not it's not known. Now, each, each TI provider we support is slightly different in how it responds and kind of what responses mean. With the result and severity columns, we've um, effectively tried to standardize that. So 
Um, regardless of what providers you use, uh, the result and severity will, will be the same across them. Let's get past this. Now, we've got 100 results there. We kind of only want to look where we've got interesting results. So what we can say is going back to our filtering in a data frame we talked about a second ago, we can say in our TI results, only show us ones where the result is true. Run that, in this case, we get a sad empty data frame because we don't have any true, true results. So what we can do is go show you what a real result looks like. So here I'm going to look up uh, look up an IOC, this one here, and then what I'm going to do is convert the results to a data frame and then use this browse results to, to look at them in a bit more detail. So what this has done is gone and um, looked up that TI in a number of providers and then given us the results in a kind of slightly easier to read format than just a data frame. So we can see this IP, which picked out earlier, um, is being found in our provider, in this case, uh, OTX, and has a whole bunch of information attached to it. So we can see OTX provides tags. We can see uh, it looks like this IP has been associated with log4j scanning. Um, we got some links to some articles that uh, reference it. So very easy way of um, looking up, looking up an IOC and getting a, a lot of information about it. And again, we can do multiple providers at once. So we've got results from VirusTotal here. VirusTotal knows about this IP address. As you can see, the the amount of information we get from, say, VirusTotal and OTX is very different, but each each is useful. Same with same with Xforce, uh, another provider. So very quickly and easily, we've looked up uh, IOCs there and multiple threat intelligence sources and, and got some useful information. Uh, we can also do things like um, connect to Azure itself to get some more information. So uh, this might be getting information about an Azure resource or um, even getting things like an instant from uh, from Sentinel. So we have this soon to be renamed Azure Sentinel feature um, or class in Mystic Pi. So what I'm going to do is here specifically import it. So I'm going to say from Mystic Pi, the data section and the Azure Sentinel section, import just the Azure Sentinel class. And then just like with the query provider and TI lookup, I'm going to create that object and connect to it. And then what we're saying is get an instant for us. But here again, I've got an error. It's telling me the subscription I'm looking for is not found. So here we say get get an instant of this ID from this subscription. Uh, this subscription doesn't exist. So what I can also do is look at subscriptions I have access to. So I can call this get subscriptions class. And I get a list of all of the subscriptions I have access to, their ID, their name, and their state. And again, this is all just pulled from the, the Azure APIs. Uh, I can then get info about them, so I can pull a specific uh, subscription, uh, look at things like locations and quotas and um, display names and all, all the kind of details behind it. From there, I can get a correct subscription ID and then call that get instant again. And what that does is return the instant I'm looking for um, in a data frame. So again, uh, this allows us to get instant and get the data, but um, not only that, we can also, using this feature uh, of Azure API integration, do things like update instance, change severity, add comments, a whole bunch of uh, different things using those APIs. And it's not just limited to Sentinel, we can also do things like get information about um, an Azure VM or um, other resources out there. So now we've enriched data. Uh, the, the kind of last thing I want to show you today is some visualizations. So another great feature about notebooks is the ability to, to visualize data that you uh, you wouldn't necessarily be able to, to do um, with uh, the visualization capabilities of Sentinel itself. However, visualizations in Python can be um, quite 
a lot of effort to produce if you want uh, to make them very uh, complex. So Mystic Pi contains a number of visualizations for common scenarios within security analysis. Um, I'll show you a few of them here. The first is a timeline. Um, again, this is something we use time and again to see events um, in order and how they relate to each other. So what we can do is uh, call this timeline display timeline feature. Uh, pass it a data set, which in this case is um, a bunch of Azure AD sign-ins, and display that out. So here we've plotted this timeline of all of those logins that we saw. Uh, we've got a range selector that allows us to like zoom in on bits. We can also hover over specific items to get results. Find one. There we go. It's a bit easier to read, so we can see who the user was and what time and what result type. And we can do all sorts of like fun interactions. We can like zoom in. We can drag over there. We can reset objects. So a really powerful visualization um, that is actually a lot of code at the back end. But because it's in Mystic Pi, you, you simply call this and pass it a data set. Very very simple and easy way of accessing a very powerful visualization. Um, we can also do some uh, other ones. So, we, so rather than have everything in one row, we can also do a timeline where rows are split out. So here we do the same display timeline, uh, but we tell it to group by a specific feature. So in this case, we're saying group by result type. And what that will do is split each value, each distinct value in result type column out of a separate row in our timeline. So we can see we've got um, all the different result types. These are all the AAD result type codes all, all split out on our timeline, allowing us a bit more granularity. What we can also do is add this ref time object. So this is a, a reference time that we want to show on our timeline as well. So this could be a specific event that you know occurred. It could be the time that an alert fired or an incident started. So we, uh, we simply add that in as ref time. And what we're saying in this case, we just grabbed a, a specific time generated from one of our data sets. But really, this, this time could be whatever we want to um, want to see. And that just overlays it for us to kind of have that, um, that contextual analysis of it. Um, let's see, we've also got the timeline duration feature. So I'm just going to get some security alert data here for the next timeline and we're going to call this timeline duration feature so this is very slightly different <clears throat> um, but called in a similar way so display timeline duration this time pass it the data set so there's alerts that i just got group by column and then we need to pass it a time and end time column you'll you'll see why in a second so what this does is takes the time column and end time column and plots a start and an end for each um, event. So in this case, each alert has a start and end time. And what we can do is plot them on a timeline and see uh, see when each starts and ends. This is really useful for seeing how stuff overlaps um, and how maybe multiple alerts within the same incident kind of relate to each other. So we can see that um, this, this alert here happened immediately after this one, but these two overlap in the the, the time they occurred. Again, really useful for seeing that context and relationship between events. Um, we also have uh, a number of things that we call widgets in um, Mystic Pi. So these are little GUI elements that make it easier to use a notebook. So here we've got uh, a select item widget that we call that effectively allows a user to just go in and select an item from a list and then reference that later. So we're saying here, select a, a network vendor, select a Palo Alto Networks. Then we can say in this next query, um, get us uh, network events where the, uh, the vendor is the one that we've just selected in the widget above, and then run that query. So these are just little elements. There's a number of different widgets in Mystic Pi, but they're little elements to make it easier to use the notebook particularly for people without coding experience. So uh, definitely 
you'll see them a lot in the notebooks we've created, but um, it's definitely the sort of thing that you should think about including for any notebook you're, you're writing yourself as well, because it makes it easier when you're sharing uh, with other, other people, uh, particularly people who maybe don't have a, as much experience with notebooks or Python. So we've got five minutes left and uh, I want to make sure we have some time to answer some questions. So I'm going to unfortunately skip the last section and just go straight to, to what to do next. Um, so there's a number of things you can do. do. Uh, go check out the getting started notebook that we have in the Sentinel portal. That will show you a number of things. It will help you set that config I talked about earlier. It will help show you some of the kind of core features of Mystic Pi and what you can do with notebook. We also have like a pre-canned lab that you can access at aka.ms slash Mystic Pi demo. That will allow you to, in just a browser, um, play around with a notebook and Mystic Pi. So that's a, a very good way of uh, checking some of this stuff out and accessing it without having to install or create anything. And then we've got loads of documentation. So Mystic Pi docs, uh, the Sentinel docs, and also uh, the Pandas docs. So as I mentioned before, Pandas is, is incredibly powerful and is kind of core to a lot of Mystic Pi. Basically all the data we collect comes, comes back as a Pandas data frame. So learning about Pandas and how to use it is, um, is very high on my list of things I'd recommend doing. Also, this notebook is available on the uh, the Sentinel Notebooks GitHub repo. So if you want to go have a look, um, run through any of this that I, I went through today, look at any more details about it, um, please, please go and do that. As I said, and as you've seen, we've got some deliberate built in errors in the notebook, so you will run into those. But again, it, it can be good practice to uh, to troubleshoot some of those issues yourself if you if you do want to run through. And with that, thank you very much. And um, yeah, keep tuned for uh, much more notebook training and content um, next year. I know we've got some some big plans for some more content. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a few questions. Uh, first one is, um, why don't you install pip by default? It seems rather tedious to reinstall pip all the time. So pip, pip is installed already because uh, pip is our package manager. So that's the thing that's allowing us to install. So that is there. Uh, with regard to, to Mystic Pi um, and the other packages you install via pip, you don't have to keep reinstalling them. Um, so in AML, once you create your compute instance, uh, you only need to do that install once. Um, from there, you can just import it each time you use a notebook um, and you, you could skip that installation step. The only thing to bear in mind is packages don't auto update. So you'll need to uh, make sure that you're at least occasionally running that pip um, install dash dash upgrade to make sure that you, you're keeping up with the latest version of the package. Um, but yes, you don't you don't have to install every package every time. I know we did here, um, but when you're you're running notebooks um, repeatedly, they will persist uh, on the compute that you have. Great. Um, the next one is: uh, Will Defender for Cloud monitor the ML workspaces? Um, that's that's a very good question. I'm afraid I don't know. Uh, I would have to have to go and check with my colleagues who work on Defender for Cloud. Great. Uh, next one is, does Mystic Pi integrate with Elasticsearch? Ah, good. Very, very timely question. Um, we do not currently, but uh, we were, are having conversations with people from the Elastic team who are keen to contribute to Mystic Pi and add that support. So we're, we're running a Mystic Pi hackathon in January where we're helping people to contribute features and fixes to, to Mystic Pi. And we're hoping that elastic search support will be added as part of that. Great. Um, next one is, does the exclamation point AZ login feature work on prem? Uh, yes, it will. You'll need to have the uh, Azure CLI um, feature installed on your, your local compute. Um, but as long as you have that, yes, it will work on prem. Great. And um, next one is, is there sample Sentinel data online? Yes, there is. 
So if you go to the Sentinel Notebooks repo, there's a, uh, a data um, folder which has uh, a number of like sample data sets we use in some of the, the sample notebooks. Um, you can also uh, find a number of um, sample items data sets um, online um, via the uh, the security data sets project. So it's it's not a Microsoft project, it's an open source project, but if you search for that, you'll find some sample Sentinel data there that you can also um, import into a notebook. Great, um, thank you, Pete, for being our guest today and for an excellent presentation. And thank you to the rest of the team who helped answer questions. At the same time, I would like to remind the listeners that the best way to ensure you don't miss any future webinars or major announcements is to visit our landing page at aka.ms slash security community. And while there, you'll find easy ways to navigate and find the resources and learning content relevant to our security products and their communities. A good start would be browsing our bite-sized product videos, ninja trainings, recordings of past webinars, GitHub communities, and more. We love to hear your feedback on how we can improve these webinars. Please take a minute submitting your webinar feedback at aka.ms slash security webinar feedback. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye.